Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Newcastle Fans TV Extra. It is the Greenwood and Mulner show with me, Jonathan Greenwood. And to the right of me, but probably to the left of you on the screen, is Sam Mulner, as I always say every week. <laughs> Good evening, Sam. How are you? Oh, I'm very well. Well, could be better after yesterday's um, game, if you want to call it that. It, was, uh, it wasn't really a match, was it? But... Um... Yeah, no, we're all we're all good apart from that. <laughs> I think. Well, I hope we're all good. And introduce a very special guest. It is Roberto Rojas. Roberto, you've been on the channel before, uh, talking about Miguel Mew, and he might be getting mentioned a couple of times tonight. Um, but Roberto, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Really appreciate it. No problem. How's lockdown being of you? Did you manage to cope okay? Uh, yeah, it's fine. I mean. We probably won't get into more governmental stuff, but it's been chill. I mean, thankfully, where I am, I'm based in Connecticut, so it's not as bad as like other states. So it's been pretty chill, basically. So what can you do? <laughs> exactly. For people that don't really know, obviously, they know so much about you talking about football or soccer, as maybe it's called in the States. Um, if you just want to enlighten people, what are you doing at the minute? Who are you working for? How are you basically getting on in life? <laughs> Wow, that's a lot to ask. Um, no, uh, I think you basically mentioned it. I, I obviously like to talk about football, be it in the United States, be it obviously within the top five leagues in in, um, in Europe. Uh, but for me, in terms of where I come from, I'm Paraguayan American, so born and raised in the United States, but with Paraguayan parents. Um, I just always had this involvement with football and always enjoyed it. So I just thought, why not uh, make a living out of it and then work in in that kind of industry so basically what i like to focus on is on paraguayan football and south american football but of course trying to dabble into any type of football be it here stateside or in europe because i think it's important to have that kind of of knowledge to say but um yeah i'm currently at bn sports i'm working as a digital content producer there and i'm also the co-host of the low limit football podcast a show that i do with my good friend, Joe Ucello, uh, we talk about everything that's going on in the world of football every week. We usually have a guest on to talk about like a specific topic or or numerous topics uh, every week. And I actually just also started a new project called Guarani Vision, which is the first ever Paraguayan football podcast in English. So we uh, just got it started with that. Uh, we just finished our second episode. And, and yeah, that's what I've been doing, just going in strong with my work and obviously talking about uh, all things football and, of course, about our lovely uh, gentleman that we're going to talk about today that I think has gotten a lot of mention from a lot of Newcastle United fans. I think he has. Of course he has. But just very briefly, Sam, it's nice to actually see someone who actually works in the field that they want to work at and actually has that <laughs> goal in their life. Is that a reference for me and you, Johnny, working in <laughs> Just <shops>? a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Roberto is living the dream whilst uh, you're serving chicken and I'm taking bets. But yeah, no, there's nothing right. And, you know, he's starting his new podcast, which um, me and you, Johnny, we, we're doing, done in the middle of now as well. So, uh, you know, lockdown presents these opportunities. So you've got to grasp them with both hands. But Roberto didn't say soccer. You did. So that that's a punishment for you, Johnny. Never mind. Roberto's Bob on saying football. You were the one that brought up soccer. I'll have to have a shot next time I see you, Sam. That's how we do it up here. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, but you say, uh, Robert, you work at BN Sports. Um, what does that role entail? What do you do on, a say, a weekly basis? Uh, so what I usually do is I'm more of a freelancer, so I, I work more in the company uh, that's based out of Miami. Obviously, being in Connecticut means that I have to work uh, at freelance. Uh using a home office, which kind of works because obviously with this whole lockdown kind of thing, nothing really changed in this case. But usually what I'm doing is working on the website, working on content, uh, usually working on the social media. So we have the rights to La Liga in Spain, Liga, the Turkish League, and the South American competitions, the Libertadores and the Sua Americana, which is basically the equivalent of the Champions League and Europa League in South America. So that's basically what I've been doing for, God, almost a year now, over a year now. I'm getting old, guys. I'm getting old. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's been fun. It's been fun. I'm also doing my master's degree. So I actually graduated from university just last year, but I decided why not one up some people and, and go for my master's as well. So I'm in the midst of doing that as well. And yeah, I guess, I guess like you said, living the dream. So I can't ask for more, basically. What is the ultimate goal, Roberto, for you? What is, if there's a particular role or a particular job or something that you would say that is my dream job what would it be 
I mean, I don't really have like a, an, a specific goal in mind. I mean, certainly I want to work in football in some capacity. I'm not going to say here that I want to work on the social media aspect or on the broadcast aspect or the PR aspect. I mean, I would be open to whatever it is. I mean, certainly as I try to dabble into all the kind of field that this business has and obviously knowing more people and trying to understand how it all works, I think it's just a case of like, you know, when the time comes, hopefully within a year's time or, or less than that, then I can just have an idea. I'm like, okay, I can go for this and, and I would be prepared. So I, honestly, it's whatever function that would work. I mean, certainly I think the main goal for anyone would be to work at like a big club in Europe or wherever, even here in, in the United States or work for a huge company like, like ESPN, NBC, whatever it may be, or be a correspondent. So I guess, uh, yeah, I guess being <laughs> sports or not. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's just that. It's just like working in some capacity with, with football. And, and also, this isn't to say that just for me, uh, specifically focusing on football. I mean, obviously, like other sports, I mean, like basketball, like we're in the middle of the, the playoffs right now. We have the MLB, NFL just started as well. So obviously, I have an appreciation of those sports given where I'm based at. And of course, growing up liking other sports, not just football. But uh, it allowed me to become just more of a of a person of knowledge when it comes to just focusing on football. But of course, whatever it may be, I could always go into other sports and and talk about that when needed. Yeah, would you be prepared to go to Europe to get that bigger job potentially, or like you say, if, you, if say a club you like the look of, for example, let's just throw Newcastle out there for <laughs> any particular reason. If Newcastle oh. said, Roberto, we'd like you to come and improve us, would you do it? Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna say, sit there and reject. I think obviously, I mean, it's a, it's it's a bold thing to say, but certainly when you start to dissect what could happen, I mean, yeah, I mean, what it doesn't even have to be Newcastle, it could be Chelsea, Arsenal, Manchester United, Liverpool, any of those clubs. Yeah, I mean, I I would not be opposed to that. I think it would be a, a dream to work for a Premier League club in in some sort of capacity. And given what I've already been knowing more of Newcastle over the last year and a half or so I, I feel like that would be something that would work better for me because i have like more of the the knowledge of the club and, and knowing more about it probably from the inside and obviously speaking to the fan bases and obviously everything else involved in that uh it would probably make it a more of an advantage for me towards other clubs for sure sam do you think it's quite refreshing that you get journalists now maybe like you say in america for example that are learning more about Premier League clubs that they might not know as much of. So say obviously Manchester United, Liverpool, Manchester City, Chelsea, Arsenal, the big clubs in England, they get a lot more media attention around the world. The fact that journalists like Roberto have gone, well, do you know what? I'm going to have a look at maybe like a Newcastle, someone that, a club that doesn't get a lot of media yeah. attention off in the States to kind of go, well, that's learning more about this football club. I mean, it's very interesting. Like Burnley didn't get a mention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want to. If Burnley come a knock in Roberto, just politely decline. There's just no need. You don't want to, you don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. But yeah, no, it is. It's it's just showing how big, you know, brand football is all over the world. No, you know, not even just the Premier League now. But um, Roberto, what I was wondering, you know, you referenced a number of leagues that you you cover with being. And, and and whatnot, but we're constantly spoon fed and and told that the Premier League's the best league in the world, and oh, nothing nothing comes close. It's I know it generates the the most money revenue wise, but is it the strongest league in the world, or is I mean I I don't think the league is that far away, or it's even Serie A now when you've got Ronaldo over there at Juventus. Um, what do you think? I mean, certainly from a marketable, stamp, not marketable standpoint, it definitely dominates all the other top five leagues. I think certainly having the English language factor plays a huge role. And I think obviously the audiences that you get to and, and obviously the players, I think this isn't to say that the, the players are exactly rubbish in the Premier League, but they are indeed of top talent. But uh, I, I think what gives the other leagues maybe a small disadvantage is you talk about La Liga. Look at the dominance that teams like Barcelona and Real Madrid have done over the last 10 years, um, making it to Champions League finals and winning Champions League finals, producing talents like Messi and Ronaldo and, and all those other type of players. I mean, you know, the Bundesliga, obviously, with Bayern Munich winning the Champions League, they deserve a mention. 
uh, you know, Serie A with Juventus and Inter. I mean, even to an extent, Liga with with PSG making it to the final. I mean, if we saw in the last, and if we saw the semifinals, I think it's a, a great demonstration of how uh, it's become much more a a div- not divided, I should say, but more of an equal playing field when you have two French clubs and and a, two German clubs in the semifinals. So I, I think it really, for me, I, I think for the Premier League, it definitely has the star attraction. I think obviously it generates perhaps much more attention than perhaps any other league. But in terms of strength, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I could probably say it is. I mean, I, I think certainly when you look at the competition that we see there and the dominance that we see of, of many teams and hopefully with this upcoming season that we see a tight race and not a dominant you know, 20 point gap that we saw for Liverpool last season, um, that will be make it, it would be more competitive because I think that's what signifies um, how good a league is, is just how dominant they can be, obviously, in European competitions, be it the Champions League or the Europa League, but also to show how tight a race is. I mean, we, we certainly see tight races in Spain, we see it in Italy, we see it in Germany as well, maybe even in France now with, with how PSG have started their season, but. Hope, I mean, hopefully we could do that in the Premier League when you have a lot of teams that are looking to compete for the title, compete for the top four. Uh, even the relegation races are, are even so tight. So, yeah, I, I think to answer your question, I think the Premier League definitely deserves the mention of maybe the most marketable. And you know what? Yeah, I, I think it's the strongest one. I think when you look at the quality that many of the teams have and, and how perhaps equal they are, um, I think it gives an advantage towards the other five leagues. It certainly seems that the Premier League, obviously, financially, it, it, it's in its own league when you look at the broadcasting uh, deals that in the UK and internationally, the Premier League is just in a league of its, of its own. Um, if you're looking at the, in terms of the quality, as you've mentioned, Roberto, I, I was asked the question last year, can you see a Liverpool and a Manchester City being like the Real Madrid and Barcelona in La Liga, just being them two in a two-horse race every single year? But now with Chelsea's investment, I know they got beat off Liverpool yesterday, but that was a kind of a mixture from last season's squad and this season's squad kind of all kind of gelling in. And that's with, let's just be brutally honest, I'm not a very good goalkeeper in Kepa. Do you think potentially now, Roberto, Liverpool and Manchester City are kind of running away with it, maybe for another year at least? I mean, it's tough to say. I mean, certainly when you compare Real Madrid and Barcelona, they've dominated, even with a slight mention of Atletico, who obviously won La Liga over the last decade or so it has to take consistent time for it to to ensure that dominance if you look at the if we look at the last 10 years of the premier league i mean we had city winning it we had liverpool winning it but we also had manchester united winning it we also had chelsea winning it we had leicester winning it so i mean you know the, and there's always going to be that kind of competition when you look at how many teams are starting to invest in their teams i mean chelsea as you said you know bringing in these players and, and obviously, I think building more for the future, even though they are more of a spending club, I think they certainly want to build something for them to hopefully achieve a dynasty. I mean, it's tough to say that a dynasty could indeed happen in England. I mean, we haven't seen such a dynasty occur since maybe Manchester United and in the glory years with Sir Alex Ferguson. But I think when you look at how teams like City and Liverpool and Chelsea, I mean, they're spending. I mean, United are always going to be in that kind of, race when they obviously have to spend properly maybe spurs are going to do something with Mourinho. i mean it, it's just it's tough to say I, I think you bring up a good point that maybe and manchester city are more better equipped than all the other teams below them but i just think that just because of the unpredictability that we see in the premier league and how other teams also are able to to invest in and try to make a dent into a title race and, and obviously go and, and contend for the title. I think it just makes it so different to what we probably see in 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 Spain, like with Barcelona around Madrid, or in Italy with Juventus and Inter and or in Germany with Borussia Dortmund and Bayern. It's just I feel as if though in the Premier League you have a lot more teams that are willing to invest more money to get that kind of equal playing field um, for for a good title race. Well, hopefully Newcastle can be that next <laughs> team that can get a bit of excellence. As Sam is laughing. <laughs> well, Roberto's parent... I'm not, I don't want to get Roberto into trouble, but his parent company B and have a lot to answer for in that respect, don't they, Johnny? 
I, oh, I can answer it potentially. Yes, I know we probably can't, but we'll say. We'll just yeah, say I know. That's why I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll leave. We'll leave that one uh, just yeah. so we don't get into trouble. Uh, but let's just talk about Miggy Almiron on then. Obviously, mm-hmm. bought in the January of 2019 under Rafa Benitez. It seems like that's such a long time ago. Um, Rafa was keeping tabs on Almiron for over a year before, I think it was nearly 18 months, I think he was potentially keeping tabs on Almiron while he was at Atlanta. Um, Mm. Before we talk about Almiron now, Roberto, let's just talk about before he came into the Premier League and Newcastle in particular. Why do you think Rafa Benitez liked the look of Almiron? Well, I think, you know, going into the story of Miguel Amino, I think he was a player that had always risen in terms of, of talent. I mean, the thing about with Paraguay, I, I think when you look at the talent that's being produced, okay, not a lot of them are going to be world beaters because when you look at the competition that they have with the likes of Brazil and Argentina and Uruguay and even in the same continent, we look at Colombia, you know, it, it's going to be so difficult to try to get talent out there when you're competing with, um, with, bigger teams with much more history and let's be honest, probably better talent. So I, I think with Miguel's case, I mean, you know, he had, I remember watching him for the first time. He was 19, I believe it was at the U 20 uh, youth tournament. So it's a, it's like the qualifiers in South America to make it to the eventual U 20 world cup. Paraguay had finished second. So that qualified them to that world cup. I think they finished into the round of 16, but already then even going outside of what he was able to do on the national team, I think he, you know, he came off at Cedro. He became a a, a rising talent, and, and Cedro Porteño are a team that are known for producing young talent over the years. So Miguel just happened to be one of those gems that had come out over the last ten years. He got his move to Argentina, which is typically found as a as a as a stopping ground for young Paraguayans who perhaps are not ready to make that big jump into Europe because of the fear that. Perhaps it doesn't go well for them and they have to come back and then they just they just have like a complete backwards uh, career to say, like, you know, playing in Paraguay in the peak of your career when you're supposed to be in Europe. Um, you know, he goes into Argentina, goes to a team called La Nuz. Uh, La Nuz is our more of a traditional side, typically outside of the big five that we see in Argentina as Boca, River, Racing, Independiente, and San Lorenzo. They go on to win the league title. Miguel scores a goal in the final. And eventually, I think that convinced him to go into Atlanta. Um, You know, he went to an Atlanta side that obviously was new, was obviously a a new team in MLS with a lot of ambition because uh, Atlanta had become a city that didn't have much of a sports history um, in, in the last 20 years. So they come in with this investment. They come in with this beautiful new stadium. Um, if you guys ever seen photos of it, um, it's it's beautiful. It's, it's like a it's like a spaceship. So he comes into this side from uh, coached by Tata Martino, the former Barcelona, Argentina, and of course Paraguay national team coach. Um, obviously, he's had a huge influence on Miguel to come to Atlanta because of a of a how big of a high regard he's being uh, known in Paraguay. Who took the country to the World Cup quarterfinals for the first time in 2010. And I think from there on, it, it just worked well. I mean, the formula that worked uh, under Tata with so many young players from South America and obviously Miggy making that connection with Josep Martinez scoring all those goals, it just worked out well. I, I think Rafa Benitez obviously definitely wanted to try something that was perhaps um, unknown territory because as we know, guys, and I'm sure you guys have learned, and then perhaps now understand is that back then maybe MLS was regarded as a, a retirement league for your your players that are in the twilight of their careers, so like Lampard, Pirlo, Beckham, uh, Slaton, Gerard, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think they wanted to invest in something and like basically say, okay, you know, we see this young Paraguayan, you know, making the realms in MLS, obviously playing in that system as a as a young player and his early 20s and and trying to make that risk into saying okay let's try to see if we can get someone who had already been seasoned playing in two leagues in South America making a jump into an attacking side of MLS with a manager that knows how to use him and then trying to see what he can do in the Premier League I think that's what really worked out for him and obviously what Rafa was able to look at him I mean certainly he's someone that you know can offer you a lot you know on the break He's a fast player, very talented, likes to work defensively. Uh, I think 
he had the attributes of an attacking player that you can see. I mean, certainly no one is perfect and Miguel certainly isn't. But I think when you look at just the way that he is uh, as a player and even off the pitch as well, I mean, certainly, you know, you don't hear a lot of bad things about him um, in like the press. I mean, obviously the smile is so contagious. It seems like everyone is probably the most famous smile in all of time's at the moment. So uh, I think it was just those factors. And, you know, obviously as we speak about him in terms of what he's done now at Newcastle, I guess you could say it, it paid off. I, I think the risk that Rafa had made kind of paid off and hopefully it can not only influence young Paraguayans to perhaps make that jump into MLS similar to what Miggy did, but also young South Americans that are perhaps thinking at like, you know, starting their careers in their in their native country, perhaps getting a couple of years outside of it, making that jump to MLS, you know, and then by the time that they're about to hit their prime of their career to make that jump into not just the Premier League, but I think in Europe as well. Yeah, for sure. So, what were your first impressions of Al Neo when he first came to Newcastle? Because obviously, Roberto speaks very well about mm. how he kind of progressed throughout his uh, throughout the youth and to probably being a more mature player by the time he got to Atlanta and kind of settled in at Atlanta. What were your expectations? Because I think from people in Newcastle, we've obviously heard the name because he was linked with us numerous of times. Um, I might talk about Martinez as well, Joseph Martinez, and I think he's been rumoured as well over the, over the years because obviously the connection that they had together. Um, but what were you expecting from Al Niran when he first arrived at Newcastle? Yeah, I mean, like Roberto said, the kind of cliche expectation from the MLS is your old-timers and any league where Bradley Wright Phillips looks unstoppable, you know, <laughs> he maybe isn't all as what it seems, but Martinez and Almiron for Atlanta were absolutely unstoppable. And it's kind of started a trend where European teams now might start to look at the MLS more frequently to get players over because there seems to be not, not a revolution, but an evolution of, you know, talent and, and real kind of strength in depth in the league, which, which hasn't really happened before. Um, the expectations from Miggy when he first came, how would he cope with the physicality of the Premier League? Uh, he's, he's got a very wiry frame moment on him, as, as we all can see, but I don't think that's been an issue with him at all. Works his absolute socks off. And after a first, the first few games where you could see defenders wanted to leave a little bit on him because club record signing at the time, there was a lot of expectation going around. Obviously, this was Rafa's big transfer that he's obviously pushed for 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 such a long time but at the end of the day he's, he's been things haven't always gone his way in terms of it took him forever to finally score a goal but he's done that now and he's one of our key players there's no two ways about it and i just hope there's there's more to come from him but that we see that we see a bit more because we need more goals more assists from him um which makes it all the more baffling why he hasn't really started this season in the Premier League. But I'm sure that will change now, especially after yesterday. Yeah, we'll, we'll discuss that maybe a little bit later about Newcastle's start of the season. But just touching on what Sam's saying, Roberto, when he first came in, there was that expectation of what he's going to be like in the Premier League. No disrespect to the MLS, but the Premier League is a different kettle of fish. And the pressure of being Newcastle's record signing, it wasn't initially like that. But with the add-ons and certain, if certain criteria were met, he would be Newcastle's record selling at £21 million at the time. I think it was at rough, roughly £21 million. Do you think he, I think what's the right word, do you think he uh, cherished the expectation, the pressure of being Newcastle's record signing and being able to play in the Premier League and trying to basically keep Newcastle up as well? Because we were in a bit of a relegation battle. I think the, the day that he was pretty much signed... Newcastle have just beaten Manchester City 2-1. And, you know, the whole ground was just kind of like, oh my God, we're going to sign this fantastic player. We've just beaten the champions at the time. That must have been very difficult to come in and just go, right, show us what you can do now. I think it was a challenge for him that he wanted to make. I think more than that, I mean, you look at, I think it was the first time in a long time as well that they broke their transfer record. I think mm. 14 years, something like that. So obviously... Yeah. When you look at how big, and, and again, like I mentioned, I think, you know, Newcastle in itself is a historic club. There's no ways, there's no wrong ways about it. I think we know 
and certainly from okay maybe it's not the big popular ones like we see in the top five or anything like that but you know obviously i think we understand how passionate the the fan base is and how big the club is that perhaps people maybe not just in the united states but also in the native paraguay understand that you know we're getting a young player that is going in to i think not just represent an entire country when it does the paraguay but also the league so that even just brings a lot more expectation but i think when you look at the person and the character that he is and you know i mentioned that beforehand I think he knew that the challenge was there. I think he knew that he wanted to be that kind of important player. Um, obviously, it, it helped that he's now probably the best player that Paraguay has at the moment, um, heading into the national team and, and looking at the players that they have. I think he understood the, the responsibility. And also, because so few Paraguayans have, have played in the league and very few have also played um, became successful. I mean, one Roque Santa Cruz comes to mind and he obviously has a big reputation uh, in the Premier League and the Bundesliga and obviously in Paraguay. I think Miguel had to understand that, you know, I want to create my own story. I want to create my own kind of legacy and, you know, I want to help the team do well. And, and obviously he, we saw that in the first half of the, in the, the, the half that he, he came into, into Newcastle. So certainly it was just more of like understanding the challenge. And I think, Knowing the person that he is and, and knowing the type of player that he is, because I think there is a big factor with the type of player that you become also becomes the type of player that you are off the pitches, the type of person that you are off the pitch as well. So, yeah, I, I think he understood the challenge, and I, I personally think he was successful in that way. I think he really came out for it. I mean, certainly it, it took a slow ride to get there, but ultimately I think for many Paraguayans and many people who have saw an MLS, you know, feel very happy and proud that that one of their best players that they produced in MLS and also produced in Paraguay is one of the best players um, on a Premier League club. And, you know, we had mentioned the whole thing of the best league in the world, most marketable, most watched. That just gives a lot of um, attention to a player like him, and it makes a lot of people feel proud. Oh, definitely, definitely feel proud, I think, Obviously, when you've got a Paraguayan international, you mentioned Roque Santa Cruz, and he's obviously been a fantastic player uh, throughout his uh, throughout, throughout his career. I think to be kind of in that sort of category potentially in the future is only going to help him hopefully in the future for Newcastle. But there's a question from one of our subscribers, Adam says, Roberto, do you feel Bruce knows how to manage and use Miguel Neuron? I feel he could be wasted under him long term. I think is that more of a positional way? Do you think because obviously. I was going to mention this with Rafa a little bit, but I, th I think we all agree that Miggy is a number 10. And I think he's a waste when he's on the wing. He can do a job there, but he's a bit of a waste. How do you think Miguel Almiron has done at Newcastle under Steve Bruce? I mean, initially, when I, I remember the first game that he played um, under Steve Bruce, it was against Arsenal, so they lost 1-0. And he was playing on the right midfield, which yeah. I was thinking to myself, okay, I've never seen him play in that position ever. And you know how it is for some players. Maybe some players just have to adapt into that position. But it was just really well known that, you know, a player that is left-footed and likes to cut in from the left uh, will not do it from the right. So, yeah, I agree. I, I think it took some time for Bruce to really get what is his best position. I mean, ultimately, when you have someone like uh, St. Maximin and also many other players on the attack, it's going to be so difficult to see where they're best suited but ultimately and knowing what we've seen of miguel be it on the national team or be it on atlanta united that he plays as a 10 that that is his best position it's always been the best position that he's had since the start of his career speaking to youth coaches speaking to coaches that have obviously known him um when when coaching him on the on those various sides is that his position is as a 10 or even as a left winger if it needs to be i think he we want him to be dictating the, the tempo and, and leading the attack if needed be to to the striker. I mean, uh, that, that's how I personally think. I mean, I'm certainly Bruce maybe has something better, obviously. Maybe he knows something more than I do. I don't know. But uh, from what I understand and, and knowing where he could be most effective, you want him in that um, role right behind the striker or on the left wing if needed be. I think when you look at when Rafa had him for the for obviously the six months before Rafa left the football club, Sam, he was part of a three ideally when yeah. Rondon. and you have the likes of Iosi Perez who he was in the form of his life at Newcastle in that particular season I still think he was the player of the season that year I know people talk about Rondon 
but I thought Perez was just Rondon had a good. slow start, didn't he? That was the only thing. But uh, well, yeah. so the same. That so did Perez. But Perez, that, yeah. that three had a real blossoming potential about them, didn't they? As, as a forward trio, but um, that didn't that didn't last very long, did it? And I still miss Rondon, but. Um, and Perez was one of them ones that you'd think, well, he'd never leave, but you'd never think someone would come in and pay thirty million for him. But we digress. Yeah, that Miggy's arrival at that time really sparked the team into life because you could see the difference. Uh, was it Huddersfield at home, where he had like three chances straight away, bang, bang, bang. Although, right, okay, he didn't score, but the energy he gave the team in that 10-ish, maybe slightly to the left roll under Rafa. It just brought so much, so much to the team. With with Bruce, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I fully agree he's he's a number 10 in my eyes, but I would have loved to have seen him on the left in that Brighton game because I think he would have done so much more to stop uh, Lamperty than um, what ASM and, and Lewis did. Lewis was crying out for help. I, I sort of felt a bit sorry for him yesterday. And I thought, well, Miggy's defensive attributes, like we saw, if you remember last season at Wolves, how far Miggy tracked back to cut off Adama Traore, who's meant to be an absolute beast of a rocket. And Miggy just cut him back, no bother. And that's just, that sums up, Al, that sums up Almiron to a T. Just hard working, not phased. He's only a small guy, but that don't put him off. He gets stuck in. And I just thought on that left-hand side, I couldn't understand. I thought it was really lazy by Bruce against Brighton just to go with the same team that played against West Ham when West Ham and Brighton are completely different sides. Brighton, much more pacey aspect to them, much more free-flowing than a very rigid West Ham. And a game like that just isn't for Andy Carroll. You could see Wilson was running the channels and, and kind of holding the ball up, waiting for support. And there's Carroll <sighs> tanking along, <laughs> lolloping around. And it, the, the attack's over. And that, that should have been Almiron yesterday. That should have been Almiron charging into the box, getting on the end of um, the work Wilson does. And I'm still. Going forward, I'm still looking forward to seeing that happening with Miggy in the 10 and, and Wilson up top. But I, I just, I, as, as Adam said in the, in the, in the comments and um, what you both said as well, he's a, he's, a, he's a number 10 out and out that can do a job when required on the left. Do you think with the, that he's been frustrated under Steve Bruce with his position? Because it seems to me that... He's played him a few times. He's dropped him a couple of times. He's played him out on the wing. He's played him as a 10 at times, and it's worked. I've also seen Miggy as an 8 at times where, and under Steve Bruce's, which I think has been incredible, to say the least. But do you think he has been frustrated in the last, say, 12, 14 months? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly when you play in a different position that you're not accustomed to. And like I said, you know, okay, it happens to all to the best players. You know they have to adapt and they have to understand what works and what doesn't. But ultimately, when you look at what they have at their disposal, you think, you know, why am I not being as effective as opposed to maybe the other ones? And it hurts. It hurts. That, you know, when one player goes off and not performing as well, maybe that just cuts off the entire chemistry of what the team can do on the pitch. Um, I mean, look again. I think that he is a professional, a, a superb professional, to say the least. I think certainly, you know, you have him playing in all these different positions that you had mentioned, and you know, he's still able to do a shift. I mean, he's not, I'm not going to say that he's been stellar all the time, but hey, at least he's he's doing something and showing that kind of energy. I remember when he first signed. I remember asking some of the fans at Newcastle, you know, what is it that they want for Mickey, you know, when he obviously makes his debut and, and starts playing, you know, more than just the goals and the assist and being creative, it's just having that kind of energy to like really give it your all on the pitch. And you see that, you see that, you see a player that doesn't have to track back defensively, he doesn't have to, but he does it anyway. You know, I think, yes, it can be a waste in terms of his energy, but he's just so fast that he's able to put in a shift, you know, even if he has to track back or going forward. So again, I think that. Ultimately, yes, it's not the best way you want him to play as, but I think um, being the professional that he is, you know, seeing that, okay, yeah, obviously 
you're not going to be perfect. And we can see that sometimes that he's not free of crit- that he is not free of criticism, as we've seen maybe in in couple games where he's missing chances or maybe just going off the channel quickly and you know obviously being accused of diving to say the least. Um, it, it, again, he he will just continue to be professional, do his own thing. And and that and hopefully that works out well for him and and then the team just has to do uh, what they need to do to to help support him. I think ultimately after that, you know, you can't really ask for more. Oh, for sure. I think I think that's what you look at in Newcastle though, Sam, isn't it? The work rate, the desire. That yeah. it's the almost like the the working attitude, the working man attitude. Because when you when you see Newcastle people, it's work until you know eight till five, you know, and whatever money they have spare. Without coronavirus, they go to St James's and watch all these uh, professional footballers, and hopefully, he can get something on the uh, on the uh, get some free get free points for Newcastle. But I think when you look at the start of this season, the fact that he wasn't picked against West Ham from the start, yeah. he still had an impact when he came on. And I thought he was brilliant when he came on against West Ham. The fact that he managed to get the assist for Hendrick, people forget about that. He again plays a fantastic ball against Blackburn. Yes, less lesser opposition. It's a cup game, but it just shows that. He is a level above a Blackburn, and he can still do a very good job when brought on. He is a fantastic asset to have. I've watched, like that. I've watched that assist to Fraser in the Blackburn game so many times. It's unreal. <laughs> Too many times, some would say. Um, I didn't kind of, I, I see, this is the thing. Like Leaving him out of West Ham, fine. I, I kind of understood it to a degree. If it was me, I would have played him, but Bruce got it right. It was the kind of game where it suited Andy Carroll and Jeff Hendrick to play. But, you know, it, it, it didn't yesterday. This is the thing. I'm, and what I did like, I love this comment by um, Ed Coles. Um, he wasn't a slow starter. The stats just took a while to catch up. I, I love that. And and the, there is something in that to, to a degree because whilst he didn't get goals and didn't get goal, uh, didn't get assists when he first came, he was constantly making stuff happen constantly being being a threat, be terrorizing defenses, running at defenses. And he's just he's just a player that Newcastle fans just similar to ASM, but you get more of a shift from Almiron than you do ASM. A- ASM's the proper kind of flair player that you've got to You've got to kind of step back and say, well, he he doesn't do this. He doesn't track back, but it's okay because he can make this happen. Miggy's the whole package. And and if he starts to get more goals and assists, it's a bit of a catch-22 because then other bigger teams will start coming in and sniffing around him if um, we don't get our act together. So it, it, it's one of them because he's got the potential in my eyes. It, it just... but. Um, Roberto, after after lockdown and the games were coming thick and fast, I thought Miggy started to look a bit jaded because Bruce wasn't really giving him a rest. And what, his, his squad management, in in many many opinion, was poor, not resting players, and then you'd have players on the bench not getting a look in. Do you think Miggy was completely ha- is completely happy and completely comfortable with Steve Bruce's management style, or? Is he just happy to graft and and work and just get his head down and get on with it? I think it's the latter. Well, you know, like I said, I, I don't recall him going out against the coach or, or anything like that. I think certainly, you know, it, it happens. I mean, you, you hear about players complaining about their managers not playing them in the right position or perhaps getting too much game time and not getting a rest. But you know, we talk about a player not getting minutes uh, per se. You know, we have to mention that. Um, you know, he, he played a lot. I mean we can't really say anything against him. Like, you know, ultimately he did end up finishing top goal score in all competitions. Okay. Yeah. It kind of helped having the FA cup um, in that kind of realm as well, but you got to recognize it when you can, I think certainly uh, a player of his stature definitely needs the rest when needed, because uh, I just think that because of the shift that he gets, certainly all players will end up losing their stamina and not, and get a feel a, a bit jaded. Like you said, I think that happens to, to all, to all the players. But um, no, again, I, 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 from what I hear and from, you know, obviously from speaking to people perhaps that are close to him, it's like, you know, he's, I think he's content to be at Newcastle. Yes. I, I think obviously like many other players want the club in a better place, obviously content for a, 
a European spot or finish in 10 or, or really challenge for a cup run, be it FA Cup, EFL Cup, whatever it may be. But I think ultimately, you know, he, he's there to do his job. He's playing in the Premier League. I think y- you see what he has able to do. I mean, again, like the whole package really. And so ultimately, whatever he has to do, he has to do. I mean, again, I, I'm not going to go in and talk about him wanting to leave the club. I mean, certainly I didn't hear anything about that either. Just putting it out there. Nothing of that realm. But I think he's happy to be at Newcastle. I think he really is cherishing that moment. And and ultimately, I think the support that he's been getting, um, you know, there's always some bad eggs out there. I mean, you're not going to convince everyone, unfortunately. Um, but I think ultimately just seeing the support that he's getting from Newcastle fans, from people in the United States, from people in Paraguay, um, I think that motivates him. I think that really does motivate him. And ultimately, we see that in, in what he's been able to do at Newcastle. And the thing is as well, that goal, his first goal against Crystal Palace, mm-hmm. the reception he got, the roar that went up, the absolute scenes, that just shows how much he's appreciated because it, it become a thing, you know, with the, the pundits over here, Almiron's not scored, they paid all this money and he's not... I'm, the fan base, we all knew that was rubbish because we knew he was working his socks off, putting in the effort, making stuff happen, and it all paid off with that late winner at Palace. And you and Johnny, you you were there that day, weren't you? Well, it was an incredible. Do you know what you can't you can't describe that feeling because it, well, maybe you can. For him, it was relief. Of course, it was. But in the context of the game, Newcastle had done had done pretty well. Let's be brutally honest. I think they've won. So I think they won three out of the last four, or they've won two of the last three going into this game, making it three of the last four against Crystal Palace. And I've never seen someone get a goal that meant so much to them, but it almost felt like it was your child that's just scored on the pitch because you could just tell straight away. He took his top and he ran straight to the corner. All the players got involved in the celebration. I think there was a little ball boy or something at the front, yes. and he started hugging him as well. And it was just like, well done. You've done, you deserve that because you've had a lot of criticism, like Sam says, with a lot of pundits and people that say that they know all about their football. I, I disagree with some of them because I think Almiron is a very good player when he wants to be. But that moment, I, that was one of the moments of the season for me. It really was, especially at St. James's. At St. James, we didn't have a lot of great moments. But if there was one, I think either that or the uh, Matty Longstaff goal against Manchester United, they're the two moments of the season for me. But I don't know, maybe just because it was just before Christmas, I'll say our news is a little bit better. But um, Roberto, how much of a relief was that for Miggy? Because, again, Sam touches on the fact that he hadn't got the goals, he hadn't got the assists. He got an assist against Manchester City the month beforehand. But that goal, he was the winner. He was, he was literally the... The, probably the most l- likable person on Tyneside that night. Well, I actually remember um, that I didn't see the game live. I was actually in Paraguay on vacation, um, ironically enough. Um, but, you know, obviously when the goal happened and looking at everything on Twitter, I, I think certainly, yeah, you agree. I, I, I think a lot of people were happy to see it because, you know, it, it's not someone that, okay, I understand that the criticism that he gets and, you know, the money that he came in being the then record signer, at least, you know, coming in with that amount of money, you're going to get a lot of pressure. I, I think ultimately pundits would understand that given that, oh, he's came up with all, all this money. He's not really scoring. He's, he has a lack of finishing, not even in this. I think he had like maybe one assist or something prior to that game. But, you know, when he did score that goal and yeah, I kind of agree. Maybe there is a Christmas factor to it. Um, so, but again, remember being there and then looking at the front covers of the newspapers the next day, you know, it was all Miggy. It was literally all Miggy in the sports covers and like all the big newspapers just showing one, the goal and two, the, the outreach of, of immense uproar and, and, and happiness that the fans have gotten for him. Because like you said, it, it's, it's a player that, you know, doesn't keep his head down is doing his work you know, obviously the smiles and mention is contagious uh, to a lot of people there. It's it's just, you can't, you can't not dislike him. You, you just can't. And it worked out for him. It really did. And and ultimately, I, I think, and of course, scoring that goal in a, in a St. James's Park, the packed St. James's Park, and seeing all of them get on their feet and celebrating it. I mean, 
yeah, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a Christmas miracle to say. <laughs> Use a pun in that one. And yeah, again, I mean, you, you, you get your rewards for ultimately doing what you end up doing on the pitch. And it, it worked out for him. And ultimately, it, it helped him, I think, in the long term. I think that goal really did see uh, another Miguel heading into the, the new year where he started scoring and scoring and becoming more creative and that kind of thing. And I think it was just a big relief for him to, to get that goal and, and to understand that, right, now that's out of the way. Now let me do my real job, which ultimately he was still doing, but it's excluding all that pressure out. Yeah, I think it was one of the best ones of the season, as I've mentioned. But uh, Roberto Keith has a question for you. Do you think there are any other players who have potential to follow from the MLS to the Premier League? And if so, who? Oh, that's a big question. Um, well, one of the good things that MLS has been able to do over the last few years, obviously, I think because of what Miguel was able to become an influence, really, we see a lot of young talent coming up and going into the league, not just Paraguayans, I think South Americans in general, seeing a lot of Argentines, Uruguayans, Colombians, Peruvians. Um, you know, we see that happening. I mean, it's so difficult to pinpoint one player that could make that jump. Um I mean, you look at maybe someone like Diego Rossi, who's playing over there at uh, LAFC. Uh, you look at someone like Ezekiel Barco, that's playing over there at um, Atlanta United. Um, you know, be on the lookout for the new team that's going to come next year with Austin FC, with uh, Rodney Redis, a, a Paraguayan forward, kind of similar to what Miggy does, uh, playing as like that pacey winger and then has a good eye for goal and likes to track back as well. I mean, there's just so much talent out there. I think ultimately... You know, if you do obviously have the chance to watch games in MLS, I know the time difference is kind of uh, annoying for you guys over there in England. But, you know, ultimately, it's not the perfect product, I'll admit. I mean, certainly for every type of league, you have to have its pros and cons. I mean, we probably see that in the Premier League as well. But you really see a lot of young rising talents coming out there. You, you mean, you also see a kind of rise of talents that eventually not just help leagues and certain national teams around maybe the biggest part of the world, but for the United States as well. I mean, certainly we see a lot of, a lot of young talent that come from MLS and then to make that jump into Europe. I mean, I know Pulisic and Weston McKinney maybe didn't do that. Okay. McKinney played in the, the MLS Academy at uh, FC Dallas, but you still see a lot of young talent out there um, that could help the national team. And, and ultimately I think a lot of people are starting to look into MLS for those type of young talents and with what Mickey has done. I think, as I said beforehand, that risk that Miggy made to not just give the reputation for him and career and for Paraguay, but ultimately for the MLS to understand that, okay, you know, if, if he can do well there and ultimately achieve something that has never been done before, of getting a player that was kind of developed in the MLS way, this new form of MLS, to then go into Europe and be successful there – it will start to, you know, open a lot of eyeballs and say, okay, where can we find the next Miguel Amiron? You know, where can we find them and and hopefully help our team become better as well? So again, a lot of young talent out there, and certainly, if if you have the chance to look it up, go for it. I highly recommend it. I've got one to put to you. Mm -hmm. So Newcastle. I mean, it's not in the MLS. It's it's South American based. So okay. I'm hoping. You've had a chance to see him. But Newcastle have been linked to what Rodrigo Vilca. I've yeah. pronounced that wrong almost certainly. Um, from Deportivo <laughs> Municipal, young Peruvian Peruvian kid. Have you seen much of him? What kind of player is he? I'll, I'll admit to you, man, I actually haven't seen much of him. Um, I was talking to a few Peruvian uh, journalists uh, who are more specialised in Peruvian football and for that player. Um, so... Unfortunately, I can't really give you a big answer for that. I mean, from what I understand, he's a young uh, attacking midfielder, kind of similar to Miguel, which maybe makes sense uh, why they're going into that kind of, of region. Um, but again, I, I actually haven't seen too much of him to give you a, a concrete answer. I apologize. I hope you're going to the next Messi or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we won't go there. Uh, we won't no, go not there. yet. Not yet. Not like my other journalists will say that. And there was a comment, though, I'd like you to discuss uh, mm -hmm. about about potentially Miguel Almiron outgrown Newcastle. Could you clarify <laughs> what you meant by that? Yeah, um, I, I think I know what you're talking about. So we had mentioned in our <laughs> uh, What a New Vision the other day, um, speaking about Miguel not getting as much playing minutes and 
ultimately when he does come in that he does the work and you saw the two assists that he got in the first two games. Um, I had only mentioned it because it was just something that my, my, the friends that, and the people that I work with, you know, we're just having a debate. I'm not saying that it is the case. I mean, certainly they have every right to have their own opinions. I, I think ultimately what we were trying to get at is, you know, is Miguel, you know, in a way just getting that kind of the stoppage at, at, at Newcastle, you know, certainly, I'm so, I mean, again, I think this player has already got interest from many other clubs around the world. I remember a, a rumor that he was close to, not not close to, but he was rumored to Atletico Madrid and Real Madrid and, and all those other clubs across Europe. I, I think what we're trying to say is that we want um, our players to do well in Paraguay. I mean, ultimately, you know, we're looking in a situation where we see a, a young Paraguayan performing in perhaps the best league in the world. And, and for that to happen, it happens to a lot of us. I think it happens that we want to, you know, we demonstrate what we demonstrated on the pitch and maybe we want a new challenge. I mean, ultimately that, that, that happens to a lot of players. Maybe they want a new challenge at like another big club in, in, in the Premier League or a big club in Italy, Germany, Spain, whatever it may be. So that's what we were trying to get at. We were more uh, asking about, if it's needed. I don't think it's the case personally. I think he still has a lot to offer. I think he ultimately has the interest from a lot of clubs, but I think he still provides an important piece for this Newcastle side that again, no players, Messi, no plays Ronaldo. No one is bigger than the team at all. Um, but it was just more of a debate in like saying, you know, we want the best out of him. We want him to do well. I, I mean, certainly he's not perfect. Like we all know. I mean, certainly he has his pros and his cons, but uh, it was just more of the case of, you know, wanting the best for him and wanting to make that next big jump because of what Newcastle have been producing in terms of their results and just the way that he's playing and the way the team's been playing, that kind of thing. Maybe it's kind of um, uh, just not seen the best out of him. So that, that's what I think that's what the argument was trying to be put at personally. Good answer. We'll let him off, son. We'll let him off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't interrogate me, guys. <laughs> um, so I'll ask you this question. I'll ask Roberto as well. Newcastle will see one win from the first two games through the next round of the league. Cup. They take on Morecambe on Wednesday. You'd like to think they'll get through that. Better off. Do you think Newcastle? Do you think Newcastle can stay up this season? The better ad. That, that that squad now, compared to where they were 12 months ago, that shouldn't be in a relegation dogfight at all. That should be uh, top, top, half, top of the bottom half or, you know, nudging top 10, let's face it. I can't wait for the front four to be unleashed and we can see St. Maximin, Fraser, Almiron and Wilson all play together with Miggy in the 10, ASM on the left, Fraser on the right, Wilson up top. That is a formidable front four. So that's not a front four that should be scrapping round for points, you know, trying to desperately cling on to Premier League survival with the likes of West Brom and Fulham. That's that. Yeah, we've got to stay up, surely. How do you feel, Roberto, about Newcastle's chances of doing well this season? Do you think Newcastle will? They might be involved in a bit of a relegation battle, but might be a bit comfortable towards the end, or do you think Newcastle can do any better or any worse? Uh, I mean, it, it's the same thing. We, we saw this in the last two seasons that they're always mentioned in the relegation battle, but they always happen to stay up in, in, in a big gap, actually, from that relegation. Mm. I think they finished, what, 12th in the last two years or something like that? So, um, yeah, and again, I think, like you would mentioned, I think this team is much more stronger than what we've seen over the last few years. I think having that front, you know, four players of St. Maximin, Miggy, uh, Frazier and Wilson certainly will definitely be formidable and, and will perhaps see off more of the lesser clubs like you had mentioned, like your West Broms, like your Fulhams, maybe even West Ham, you know, uh, and many other clubs out there as well. Aston Villa, maybe. Um, I say, yeah, I, I think, I mean, look, I said it off the record, I, I said that they will stay up. Um, I'm not going to, I don't want to say where they'll finish per se, but I know that they will stay up. And ultimately, I, I think if they do finish in that mid table, kind of, you know, 11, 12, 13th kind of position. Maybe the top 10, maybe. I mean, certainly we've seen stranger things in 
in this 2020. Um, but yeah, I, I think with the talent that they have and kind of the pieces that they've improved on, um, I think they do have enough to to go uh, and stay up in the Premier League for another season. For sure. I think we've got uh, one very quick question. When is your next visit, Roberto? Once this coronavirus is out of the way, is do you plan on coming back to England? Obviously, you've been to Newcastle as well, haven't you? And would you like to come back when everything's obviously safe to do so? One hundred percent. I mean, ultimately, when I went to Newcastle last um, last year, you know, going into that was my second time in England. I actually been to England beforehand, but staying in Newcastle for that kind of Easter weekend, I remember going to the game. It was against Southampton, where Isaac Perry scored a hat trick, and just you know, being well received by so many great people. I mean, you know, ultimately going out. I mean, understanding what a spoons is. I mean, I've never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I, uh, knowing what a grab is as well, it's like it's um, no. I, I think the, the the culture of the Jordy people are immense. I think they're very, very welcoming. I think they're very you know amazing. Like I said, I, I think certainly being there and and just it, it was a great time. And I would love to come back. I think ultimately everyone wants to come back to a place where they they feel appreciated. And uh, for me personally, it's. There are some wonderful people that I've been able to mention that I've been able to meet, uh, you know, ever since the Yamar own transfer happened. It it really helped me and it really allowed me to meet new people and to understand a city that I think is very passionate in in every right, not just in its football, but you know, you'd mentioned that kind of working class mentality and, and just trying to enjoy, enjoy life and what. Um, again, I'd love to come back and hopefully I will once this whole COVID thing clears off. For sure, you have to go and get a steak, bag and a Newtie Brown Ale at Weatherspoons next time you're in Newcastle, to say the least. But uh, Miguel, it's been a uh, Miguel, not you know Miguel, you are Roberto. Um, <laughs> I was getting so well. <laughs> Roberto, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on tonight, or this morning, or this afternoon, whatever time it is, and uh, wherever you are today. But um, all I can say is, is thank you so much for that insight on Miguel Almiron and basically what you think about the Premier League and Newcastle in general. It's, it's quite refreshing to hear. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. No problem at all. And Sam, another fantastic guest. Yeah, love that. Great. Uh, that that absolutely just flew by, didn't it? Really enjoyed it. Fantastic. Like and subscribe to Newcastle Fans TV Extra. If you want to listen to this podcast, it'll be available on Spotify and on iTunes and any Google podcast as well. And we'll have another uh guest i think next week potentially as well so it keeps on going this green minimal on the show sam doesn't it we'll uh hopefully get another few more episodes down the line but again if we can keep on getting the guests like uh, like roberto i think we'll be in for a treat won't we yeah yeah we've got a another one already penned in for the next episode so we uh we keep on rolling we do we do indeed again like and subscribe to newcastle fans tv newcastle fans tv extra and we'll see you all very very soon